We're live. All right, folks, welcome to another edition of the Pag Pride Weekly Podcast. We are here in the very cozy confines of the Jimmy V room here at Amedios. Uh, you know, the entire restaurant is buzzing. In fact, I had to park on the backside of the restaurant just to, to find a spot to park. But uh, I believe there's some holiday parties going on tonight. Yeah, this is the holiday season, <laughs> uh, as the song says. And so, uh, yeah, it's a very busy time here for Medios. I guess the word got out that you can reserve a Medios for your uh, holiday party. So that's a good thing. Um, I wonder who that came from. <laughs> well, you know, we, we did our part. Uh, uh, maybe one or two folks here are because of uh, listening to the old Pack Pride Weekly podcast. Um, you know, I, I didn't have an opportunity with it being so busy to, to talk with Dave about what he wanted to promote. But I, I think the usual stuff typically applies, which would be, you know, with the uh, Louisville game coming up, if you want to grab a meal here before the game, uh, after the game, uh, or, you know, if there's an away game and you want a great place to watch one of the upcoming games, be sure to come on by Medios. They'll have watch parties for the bowl game, if I recall. So mm -hmm. uh, reach out to the fine folks here at Amedio for your catering needs. I mean, it's just, um, you know, the usual suite. If you're a regular listener to the uh, Pack Pride Weekly Podcast, you know that uh, Amedio's takes care of us. So take care of Amedio's and uh, it will, we'll keep that uh, beautiful synergy going. So, uh, Corey, it's great to see you in person. Uh, <laughs> first time we've had an opportunity to see you. Uh, give it up for Corey, everybody. <laughs> I am definitely not the big guest here tonight, but yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be back here. I don't know what we're going to do next week because it's the day after Christmas, but uh, I'm glad to be back to Avenidios at least for this week until we kind of figure out what we're going to be doing moving forward. But obviously the big reason why we're here live is because we wanted to have Shaheen Battle here live with us too. So yes, yes. Sorry, uh, cats out of the bag on that one. Well, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If you're watching a live, uh, watching along live on YouTube or Facebook, you can see uh, Shaheen seated right next to Corey's left there. So let's not waste his time any further. Let's go ahead and bring him on. Shaheen Battle is joining us. How are you doing, Shaheen? I'm doing good. <laughs> hey, I'm doing good. How are you doing? Yeah, I asked you before the show if you prefer Shaheen or Shai. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Either, whichever one you prefer. Uh, you can go by Shai. Shai? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, you play a position that is, is not for the shy or the faint of heart. Uh, we'll get into that just a little bit. But uh, you're also putting yourself out there in another way. Um, you have released uh, a line of uh, clothing, uh, your own branding here. Yeah. Uh, tell us what it is, and and this is kind of a, as you said, a little bit of a local release party. So yeah. we're honored to be a part of a part of that. Yeah. So explain what you got going on. Yeah, so uh, I got a clothing line I designed uh, my freshman year of college called Battle Island. Uh, it's a brand that represents you know people that go through hardships, you know perseverance. Anytime you know down and you know you need help or feel like you're at your lowest point. Always find a way to just battle and come through, and mm -hmm. um, you know, find a way to just be successful or get through those rough times. You know, sometimes you're alone, but you know, you're never really alone. You're only alone, you know, because you think you're alone. But there's always somebody there in your corner that are waiting for you to reach out to them for help. And you know, that's pretty much what Battle Island represents: is just find a way to be successful, overcome hardships, and um, you know, take over, take over, take on any battles that come in front of you, you know, head on head by yourself with help. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what Battle Island is. But um yeah, tonight I'm announcing uh, my uh, partnership with Obsess. Uh it's a new NIO marketing platform for athletes. And you know, this platform that I will be selling my merchandise on. So I'll have all my Battle Island products up there. Mm -hmm. Um this partnership consists of me uh being an ambassador um and equity owner of the um a company and you know that's that's pretty major to me my mm -hmm. first business proposal and you know i'm pretty excited for it and i'm grateful and thankful for it all right so i gotta ask why why obsess like why was that what you wanted to go in with um well i was introduced by uh molly thompson with mm -hmm. uh, turn bridge marketing and she was i did an internship with her over the fall of this semester and we um met tracy and uh, john Lynn with um obsess and they were just telling me about their platform and it's just, we connected in so many ways and, you know, our goals was very, very similar. And we just, you know, ended up getting a good feel for each other, building a relationship. And um, they uh, eventually offered me a business proposal and, you know, I couldn't really say no. You know, it was a great connection there as far as the, my team around me, the resources they have and the way they can help me grow. And, um, you know, it was more so feeling like, a family bond more than mm -hmm. anything that I chose to go with Obsess just because I got to, you know, be a part of something from the beginning and, you know, me being able to be helped in that, you know, sense, you know, it was just really 
big for me at such a young age. Um, but, you know, the things they have to offer is just so beneficial to me. Um, they have NFTs that create custom to me. Like, I can put a pair of my game-worn cleats, make them an NFT, and I can, you know, sell them to fans. So that's, like, something I can bring my fans closer to me with, and I mean, that's something different. You know, not, not a lot of people are really doing that right now. So for us to, you know, be early online, you know, I want to take that on and be with them when this happens. So, you know, this is something big, something special, and – the best thing about it is, you know, it's all authentic to me. And, you know, I can market mm -hmm. the way I want to. And that's the best part about it to me. You know? so. Well, I did want to ask you, too. One thing Molly wanted me to make very clear with you was the fact, or very clear on this podcast, was the fact that all of this has become because of the hard work that you've you put in this past semester. And obviously, you've also played football this past semester, too. So that's uh, a lot of hard work on and off the field. Uh, how much have you learned through that experience that, that kind of taught you about the NIL world as well as, you know, the marketing world and, and putting yourself out there, too? Uh, it's taught me a lot. Um, you know, Molly, she did a great job teaching me about, you know, finances, how to start a business, um, how to plan for photo shoots or, you know, business meetings and those types of things. So it taught me a lot about how to actually think as a business and not just as an athlete. And um, that helped me a lot as far as, you know, growing my own brand because I'm using what she's teaching me and applying it to my own company. So um, just, you know, working with her, it was very, very beneficial. I felt like it was more of a classroom than, you know, just a job. And that's, yeah. that's how it should be. That's where you're comfortable, right? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> but, I mean, a, a young man in his early 20s forming, you know, a company uh, – mm -hmm. Uh, just uh, a remarkable thing in and of itself. Uh, have you always been or had an entrepreneurial kind of, you know, uh, yeah. pursuit? Um, I actually have. Um, like, since I was a kid, I used to just, and I would be in class, finishing my schoolwork, elementary school, I would just start drawing. Mm -hmm. And I never knew what I'd be drawing, but it all make up to be something. It was just something creative, something different. And I'm like, I think I want to start a clothing line one day when I, you know, get older. And I never knew I would name it Battle Island. Um, I thought it would be like SLB or SB or something like that. But, um, you know, just once I got to college, I realized I can really, you know, put into perspective. I could meet people and help me grow and create a brand. So that's what I did once I, you know, got the platform to do so. And for folks who want to go and check out, uh, you know, your brand and, and the things that you're uh, going to be offering here, uh, where's the best place for, for folks to see what you have going on? Um, I have my my uh, website set up on Obsess platform. Okay. So you can go, go to uh, my Instagram link or uh, we can provide a link to you. But, yeah, it's on Obsess. Okay. All right. And you mentioned, too, having kind of an ambassador role. I mean, what does that entail and, and how did that come about as well? So the ambassador role is pretty much um, what I'll be doing is like uh, marketing and promoting my products on Obsess, also promoting Obsess in um, total. So whether that be just reaching out to friends and athletes about Obsess or, you know, telling guys like, hey, you know, this is a platform you could utilize to help benefit you in NIL world as far as connecting with fans, um, <clears throat> connecting with sponsors and reaching potential NIL deals, you know, just off of this platform alone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just creating revenue for athletes. So that pretty much be my role, you know, just kind of winging in and uh, telling guys about what Obsess is and how, can, how people can benefit from it. So I got to say that the cat may be out of the bag now at this point, but we're planning on returning to NC State next year, right, at this right. point? Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's the plan. <laughs> got you. Let's, let's right. seal the deal. Right. <laughs> and as far as, the, as far as the Dukes Mayo Bowl, too, I've got to ask about, you know, what's coming up next. I mean, how much are you looking forward to that game and, and matching up with Maryland, too? Uh, well, you know, Shad doesn't like Mayo. Yeah. But. <laughs> oh, that was, that was part of my next question, so we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. But, but um, I am, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, I know a couple guys over there play for Maryland. Um, I talked to them, and they, they excited to play us. And, you know, I know it's going to be a challenge, and NC State never backs down from a challenge. So, you know, we're going to come in ready to eat. And as far as the Mayo is concerned, I mean, is that just not a condiment of choice or? Uh, no, no, never, <laughs> never has been. Um, I don't know if it will be. <laughs> I, won't, I won't tell the people over at Duke's Mayo. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, a, a you, opportunity. So he'll be volunteering for the Duke's Mayo bath is what he's yeah, saying. Yeah, I, I think. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe years down the road when you get into coaching, perhaps, uh, when it's all said and done, uh, you'll find yourself underneath the, uh, a bucket of mayonnaise. Uh, 
which is a very strange sentence to say out loud. I just uh, realized that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, it's an opportunity for NC State, obviously, to face off a former, uh, you know, ACC foe, a team that, uh, you know, for us older NC State fans, we remember the days of uh, Gary Williams and played in some of those, um, you know, the Ralph Friesen era, you know, ter yeah. uh, Terrapin teams, uh, the, the ones that stood in the way of uh, Philip uh, ever beating them. Uh, so there's, there's, there's history. There's some bad blood there between uh, NC State and Maryland that dates back uh, many, many years. Um, but you said you had some familiarity with some of the players, but since, you know, I don't know when it was that they left for the, the big 10, but it's been it a while. Like over a decade ago. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've grown up in an era where they haven't been a part of the ACC. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten any kind of feedback or, or any of the older folks, like maybe coach rough that's told you about some of the, the old, uh, you know, Maryland ACC days? Uh, no, we probably get more to us, you know, the bowl game approaches, but uh -huh. right now, no, we haven't really spoke too much about Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I know there's a lot of NC State fans like myself who kind of miss them being in the ACC because they were an easy <laughs> team to hate. They, you know, outside of Carolina, they were a fun team to to really kind of focus a lot of your anger and, and attention to. Um, but it should be a fun uh, a fun game, and uh, you know, I know a lot of NC State fans are, are looking forward to that. Um, what uh, you know, uh, as as you are prepping for this, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, off season news that's taken place. Um, are you, I mean, is it safe to assume that you'll be playing in the game uh, coming up? Yes. Okay. Yes, all right. Good. Playing. Good. Just want to cover all the basics. <laughs> yes, <here>. exactly. <laughs> um, uh, what sorts of prep has gone into uh, game planning for the Terrapins? Um, so right now we're just doing a lot of, you know, reflection on the season as far as, you know, getting correct and what we could have did better in the game. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, getting the younger guys some reps and practice, getting them to get a good feel for, you know, what it's like to play. Because, you know, a lot of times young guys don't get a lot of reps in the season. So, again, doing to give opportunity to show what they can do um, postseason and before the bowl game, you know, potentially getting some reps in during the bowl. So that's pretty much where we're at right now. Um, you know, starting tomorrow, we'll start prepping as far as, um, you know, getting back in runs as far as uh, playing game planning and seeing what we're going to do to uh, Maryland. Yeah. I want to ask you, too, I mean, you talked about the – you know, obviously working uh, the internship this past semester, but how much has the time that you've had at NC State helped you prepare for you know, being able to launch your own brand, being able to partner with a place like Obsesh to, to get to that point? Um, NC State has helped me a lot. Um, you know, a lot of the resources that I've used to build my platform have been from NC State, from that being designing my logo to – find a brand to launch with, you know, so um, a lot of resources I've learned here, you know, just being an athlete, um, just some of the stuff we do on the regular, like time management, um, being disciplined, communicating, um, you know, staying consistent, just small details like that, that, you know, kind of get a feel for and just become natural. Those, those soft skills like that kind of really helped me a lot. And we, Molly's here, we should mention. Uh, and so uh, I want to recognize her for coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, as we've talked about NIL over the you know past few months, one of the things that keeps coming up, and one of the things that I, I kind of latched on to uh, as something that I hadn't really considered but thought was really neat was the opportunity now that you guys are afforded to do things like internships and make connections with people within the NC State community who have businesses or have opportunities um, that normally or in the past had not you know previously been open to a lot of student athletes who were so kind of restricted in what they could do. Um, you know, I, I know it's uh, an easy thing to say, but I mean, I, obviously that's something that opportunity uh, that NIL has provided is something that uh, wouldn't have been there five, six years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think it's uh, it's great that, you know, you're reaping the benefit of this and, and, you know, you're sitting here before us, you know, discussing obsession, you know, battle Island for, you know, uh, as a direct result of kind of the NIL rule changes and the NIL, NIL structure that's now in place. Yeah, and I was gonna say too, the the angry ape. Where did that come from, and how much is that gonna be a part of this as well? So you know, I feel like I got I got I got two um, personalities. I got shy on the field, and you got shy off the field. Um, so the angry ape is. I'm gonna assume the angry ape is on the field, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> that's that's the angry ape on the field. Um, you know, when I get on the field, man, I just feel like. I'm a beast. Like I'm, I feel like an ape. I feel like that's who I am out there. So I feel like you know, play hard, play tough. I like to come down and hit people, be aggressive, and I call myself the sniper because you know you don't see me, but you're gonna feel me. You know, that's that's kind of <laughs> what I say. 
And, um, yeah, that's that's the eight right there. That's the angry eight. And how much do you feel like you've grown on the field these past couple of years too? I've I've grown a lot. Um, the game has slowed down for me um, each and every year. I'm um, understanding route concepts. I can, you know, read things a lot faster. So the game's game's been slowing down a lot for me. You know, I appreciate my coaches, you know, watching film with me, um, giving me those reps and practice, getting prepared. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a lot of good preparation you know, through the coaches and training. Obviously, some big news that came down from the staff perspective of NC State was the fact that Tony Gibson signed a new three-year contract and will remain NC State's uh, defensive coordinator. Um, I'm sure, you know, all of you guys are excited to know that, uh, you know, at least at the top of the defensive staff, there'll be some continuity. Um, you know, were you concerned at all that there might be some teams uh, trying to pursue him? Uh, you know, what were some of your inside the locker room perspectives on all of the changes and, and shifting that we've seen among the college coaches? Um, we knew we knew Coach Gibson was, you know, it's more than it's more than just being a coach for him. Um, it's more, you know building something special, doing things that haven't been done before. And, you know, he's, you know, he's a man of his word. He would like to finish what he started. And, you know, that's, that's what we all did as a team, you know, running back pack this past season. We all said he wanted to finish what we started. So, you know, he's been a man, great coach to us. And being, like I said, you know, it's, it's a family at NC State. So, you know, he came home, stayed with us. And, you know, we really appreciate him. You know, he appreciates us. And, he wrote the he brought the news to us when he got the got the new extension and he said he really appreciates us and um we appreciate that for him telling us that you know that means a lot to us as players and um you know he's a great coach always has been and you know we know he's just gonna get better and better. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's been some concern for NC State fans about what the defense might look like next year because of how many experienced guys are gonna be leaving the program, not just because of you know wanting to leave, but because of the fact that they're graduating. I mean how good do you feel about the secondary going into next year, especially with you returning, Aiden White returning as well, and obviously you know, several other guys in the secondary that are waiting for their opportunity? I feel I feel really good about our secondary. Um, you know, we 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 want to we're really building something here, and you know, it's been telling over the past three seasons. Um, and you know, we're just gonna keep getting better, as you can tell. We got guys that can step up when needed, mm -hmm. and you know, that's that's what matters. It means that you know, no guys going unnoticed. Every guy's putting that work in, and then, when their name is called, they're ready. And, you know, that's that's what we need at NC State. And we're just going to keep bringing in more and more guys as the years go on. Were there any young guys this year that we didn't see that, that stood out to you? Um, I like I like Nate Evans and Jackson Vick. Those are okay. those going to be some guys that I feel like going to really make some plays in the corner room soon. I was going to say, you would pick two corners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, when we had uh, Nate Irving on last week, he mentioned how Terrell Manning came in and as, as an 18-year-old kid was came right up to Nate Irving and said, I'm going to take your spot away from you. Have you had some of that similar interaction? You're, you're now one of the upperclassmen, one of the, the, the older guys in the room. Have you had some uh, interactions with some of the younger kids coming in and say, man, I'm going to be taking your spot? No, I no? actually, I haven't. I okay. mean, it's more, you know, guys want to learn from me. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's, we, we compete and we work hard, but we all know it's love and, Nobody's trying to, you know, rub anybody the wrong way. Um, we all love each other. We all, you know, learn from each other. You know, more than anything, you know, guys like to come to me and work with me. So um, I appreciate that. You know, I like working with the younger guys. Um, I like working with the community as well. So, um, you know, just me being able to feel like a leader and be a leader towards these guys, that, that feels good. Yeah. Now, Nate uh, said that while there was some of that, uh, you know, competitiveness, but it, it, I think he ultimately said it brought them together and they're like, you know, fast friends for yeah. life pretty much from it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's no uh, one way to do it. Some guys come in brash and want to, you know, yeah. tell you they're going to take your spot. But uh, Yeah, we usually, you know, the corner room usually we real chill, real calm. We laugh and joke, but not really gets no crazy. So we, we all good bros. I don't know why that seems unusual to me. I, I feel like the <laughs> cornerback position is the one where there's the most smack talk that happens on the field, right? On the field. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> To the opponents a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which are supportive behind the scenes of each one. Yeah, yeah. We all support yeah. each other. Well, and I've got to ask you, you mentioned, you know, obviously the fact that, you know, Battle Island is the name of the brand. How important was it to have that, that family name on there too? Because as we see, you've got plenty of family in here and we see it every single week, week in and week out. We see the, you know, the Battle jerseys uh, in the stands. How big of a deal is it to have that name attached to this too? Uh, it's it's a real big deal, and um, it was kind of hard trying to get it attached at first, but you know we found a way 
And, um, you know, it's, it means a lot to me. You know, that's my last name. I carry it everywhere I go. And, you know, I'm, I'm working on leaving a legacy behind this name. And the more people know it, you know, the faster I can spread. And, you know, it's more than just a name. You'll understand what the name really means and what I've been through to create this name. So that's what I want to do, you know, kind of like a Michael Jordan story a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you're dreaming big. You, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Dropping MJ references. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, well, uh, obviously, uh, we're going to be excited to see how NC State, uh, you know, fares when they face off against Maryland, uh, an opportunity to win nine games. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember right off, would that be three straight seasons where they've won nine games? Uh, yes. So, I mean, that would be rare. No, because no, eight and it was eight, eight wins and, okay. All in right. 2020. Yes. But five out of the last six years, I believe. Yeah. I mean that's that's rare territory. I mean I know that you know a lot was made about the fact Seven. that they have not gotten to that ten win mark. Um, you know, felt like last year was a great opportunity, but for UCLA backing out of the bowl game at last minute. You're welcome to throw any thoughts that you uh, would like to about uh, how frustrating that might have been. Uh, yeah, it was it was it was a frustrating time. Um, guys, you know, went down there to have a good time, and you know we went down there thinking we we're gonna have to play a big game against UCLA. And we kept hearing rumors all week that, you know, a game might get canceled, COVID. Then, you know, the coach went out and said that we were going to play. So we were like, okay, we're going to play. And then two hours before the game, we found out we're not playing. So it's like, you know, wow. Then, you know, to not even get that 10th win, even though it was a forfeit, we know guys was a little, you know, shaking up about that. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, NC State, we, we some hard workers. We're we going to keep going until we get what we deserve. Yeah. Yep. I had to drop this note in here. My uh, my wife dropped in a note on Facebook and said, Chloe and Harper, my two daughters, said hey to you, by the way. I just wanted to make sure I dropped that in because I know that Chloe can understand what I'm saying. Harper is uh, a month and like three days old, so she's not understanding any of this. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, Harper. <laughs> um, well, do you have, uh, before we get out of here, do you have uh, holiday plans other than the bowl game? Do you, you know, or are you planning, where, where are you planning on spending Christmas Day? We'll spend Christmas Day at my mom's house. Uh -huh. Christmas pajama party, so that's how we're nice. doing it. It should be fun. Do you have some Battle Island pajamas uh, in the works? Well, let's, uh, we're getting there. Okay. All right. yeah, we're, we're getting there. Just Next me, Christmas, right? <laughs> just give me 3%. Uh, all, uh, that's, all, that's all I ask. That's all I ask. Um, all right. Well, I uh, really do appreciate you taking some time to, to join us and, and speak with us. Uh, I, did we, did, was there anything we didn't cover before we uh, move on in our second segment here and talk about basketball? Um, well, feel free to come out to the Battle Island out of 252 Camp Showdown. I'll be hosting in either this, either this spring coming up or in the summer, um, ages 6 to 17. Free to the community, you know, calling all the top athletes in East North Carolina. We're here to get better, grow, and be successful. That'll yep. be the second annual one, right? Mm -hmm. That'll be the second annual, right? Because you did it this yes. past year, too. Yeah, yeah. And where is that held? In Rocky Mount. Rocky, Rocky Mount. Mount, okay. Perfect. All right, so again, follow you uh, on your socials um, to, to get more. Battle two, shot Battle point. Shot Battle 2.5, yes. Okay. On Instagram. Okay. Nice. And, and shy out of 252. Yeah. Yeah, and out of 252 Camp Showdown for – the count. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, let's take a break uh, and we will uh, talk a little basketball here on the second segment of the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, <laughs> nice job, man. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Appreciate you as always, man. Oh, yeah. Thank yes, sir. You. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I did all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you did great. Awesome, you did great. That was awesome. Got the message across, and that's all you can ask for. <laughs> yeah. And yes, he sir. Heather, Corey's wife, uh, sent out three hearts, so she she got the message loud and clear. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Oh. Oh, yeah, right here. A lens cap. And <laughs> yeah, make sure you don't miss that one. Yes. <laughs> All right. Do we want to talk? Uh, maybe a, we didn't really get too much into the Belk Bowl. Do we want to talk a little bit more about that before we switch to, to basketball? Or Yeah, we can a little bit because that one's next week. So Yeah. 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 
So, but we'll have plenty of time left towards that in this turn too. I'm going to turn down this mic. There we go. Well, oh, still feedback. <laughs> All right. What? Yeah. Do what? Yeah. Yeah, just a couple. <laughs> Lord, I hope there's Hello. not any that commit during this podcast because I'm not able to look at it. So. Oh, I got, I got a few text alerts. <laughs> Different levels. Yeah, yeah. We're still live. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate you. If you tune in to us every week live, you get to hear the mid-segment banter that we're famous for. It's probably Kelly. I think Kelly's uh, at, yeah, he's at Lambo. He said uh, the email he would be, right? Nice. Yeah. Yes, that's beautiful. <laughs> What is that? A, it's happening. What is it? So make sure everybody can oh. see it. That they've now announced that for immediate release, coaches have confirmed have, they will have Mayo Bath if they win. So <laughs> they yes. yes. So we were. I think we were a little concerned about Dave Doran and and yeah. whether or not he might do that. Yes. Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate you listening, Anthony. Anthony said he's listening from Los Angeles. So. Oh, hey. Nice. I, know, I appreciate Anthony. that, man. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate it. Ready to jump back in? Let's do this. So we can talk. I mean, this past weekend, I think, will probably be more of the discussion point and then some basketball, too. Men's okay. and women's basketball. All right. Uh, Maybe we can do Duke's Mayo next week because we can do it on – probably do the podcast. I'd rather do it on Tuesday of next week just because I have so much going on. But Actually, well, uh, it's a little awkward talking about it uh, in a live stream here. But uh, I, I will be on the road uh, okay. next week, so I don't know if I will actually have the Okay, let's talk Duke's Mayo right now then. Okay. <laughs> appreciate, appreciate that. Yeah. All right, folks, welcome back to the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast. I love getting the opportunity to interrupt whatever conversations are taking place in between the segments with my dumb voice. Um, we are uh, going to talk a little bit more about the Duke's Mayo Bowl uh, before uh, we conclude here. Um, because, you know, with the holiday season, we, we may or may not have the opportunity to uh, do a podcast uh, in advance of the game. But I uh, want to cover all our bases. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of hinted a little bit at it with uh, Shaheem, like, you know, have they had an opportunity to kind of look into, you know, uh, what Maryland, you know, you know, what sort of scouting report they might have on, on the Terrapins. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be completely honest. I have not paid a whole lot of attention to the Big Ten um, and Maryland included in that. Um, so what should NC State expect uh, to, to see both offensively and defensively from Maryland when they face off against them? Yeah, I mean, you know, the big thing for, for this team is they've been a really good offense throughout the season. I think they rank top 40 when it comes to passing yards per game. Uh, top, They're about top 60 when it comes to, you know, points for. Uh, but points against, they've they've been a pretty good defense as well. You know, the thing with them, too, is is it's all based on the success of Talia Tagovailoa. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, to his younger brother, transferred uh, over to Maryland. He's thrown for 2,700 yards so far this season. Uh, he's also, you know, a rushing threat at times, uh, but he's more of a passer. You know, the the big thing for for them when it comes to their offense is going to be whether or not they can get the run game going. Uh, Roman Hindy has been a guy that's been really good so far this season for them, almost a thousand yards uh, and averaging a little over five and a half yards per carry. Does have ten touchdowns, and then, you know, their their passing game is a little all over the place. They have you know three different guys that have caught for over four hundred yards, but nobody that's that's had over 500 yards receiving so far hmm. this season. So uh, I, I do think it's going to be an interesting game to watch. Uh, it, most of the teams that that Maryland has beaten so far this season have been, 
you know, kind of weaker teams. You know, I mean, you look back at the schedule, I'm looking at it right here in front of me. They beat Buffalo to start the season. They beat Charlotte the very next week, which Charlotte was not a very good team. Uh, SMU they beat, which was probably one of their better wins. They, they beat Michigan State that finished below 500 so far this season. They beat Indiana that finished below 500 this season. They beat Northwestern that finished below 500 this season. And then Rutgers that finished below 500 this season. The other teams that they face, you know, granted, the losses that they had were to number two, Ohio State, number 14, Penn State, right. uh, number four, Michigan. Like, there were some very good teams they lost to, but they just didn't be a quality opponent all season long. So I'll be interested to see how they look when NC State faces them because I haven't really, you know, we haven't really dug into the specifics just because of how insane recruiting has been lately and how insane the transfer portal has been lately. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, what I do know about Maryland is the fact that they just haven't, Again, they just haven't proven uh, that they can beat a quality team so far this season, despite the fact that they're 7-5 and five and you know finished uh, with four wins in the Big Ten. Well, for those who are uh, – you, you kind of uh, hinted at it that, you know, things have been rather chaotic, um, you know, all over the place, whether it's, you know, recruiting, transfer portals or whatnot. But, Family life for me, yeah. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> yes, that as well. Yeah. Um, I, I'm looking at a list here that shows that it looks like three players have so far decided to uh, from Maryland have decided to skip the bowl. Deontay Banks, uh, Dante, is it Demas or Damus Jr. Demas. Uh, and Jacob Copeland. So, um, you know, if they're declaring for the draft, it sounds like they are talented players who uh, would be um, some key losses for Maryland uh, heading into that game. Um, you know, I don't begrudge any kid who decides that they would rather, you know, prep for the NFL draft versus, um, you know, uh, play in a bowl game, especially since it sounds like their season, um, you know, I didn't catch their final record, but it sounds like it was pretty close to seven, seven and five. five. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So not, not a, uh, a season with a whole lot of stakes at the end of it in terms of like, you know, winning the, the Mayo bowl is not going to push them over the top to 10 wins, for example. Yeah. Um, so, um, but the one thing I will say, the only, the only player so far that we know of for NC state that's out of this game is obviously Devin Carter that we found out last week. Mm -hmm. Entered the transfer portal. That was a weird situation, but we won't really touch on that too terribly <laughs> much. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, we found out that he wasn't going to be in it because initially it was talks that he was going to enter the NFL draft. We ended up entering the transfer portal instead, uh, which, you know, good for him. He has a chance to go out, spent five years with NC State, has a chance to go, uh, you know, get more playing opportunity at another place and, and have a different role. So, uh, but I think right now for NC State, the big thing for them is, is having every player play because, mm -hmm. you know, even guys like, you know, a Drake Thomas, Peyton Wilson, uh, that, that may have an NFL future, Isaiah Moore as well. You know, all of those guys still have something to prove, you know, on the offensive side of the football, every guy that, you know, and I think you're going to have some young receivers have to step up in this one. You know, a guy like Terrell Timmons that has been mm -hmm. good, not great so far this season, but, you know, we've seen it kind of slowly rise. I think you'll see him have a big opportunity in this game. You'll see some, Young guys like, I mean, maybe Porter Rook steps up in this game too and getting a chance at maybe a little bit of outside receiver uh, in this one. So there's going to be a lot of guys that I think have an opportunity in this one to, to really to prove themselves, and you're going to have all the experienced guys that have been around. Also, not to say that he's going to start, not to say that anything is going to happen, but uh, MJ Morris has been back at practice. Hmm. Uh, he's been practicing with the team. I mean, I talked to Michael about this last week on, on our, our Red Carpet podcast, and we're like, you know, is he going to play in this one? <laughs> Michael said, if he was my kid, he wouldn't be. Just because of the fact that you want to have him ready for next season. You want right. to be sure uh, that he's going to be ready to go for next season. So I don't know that you'll have him back, but uh, yeah, you know, there is he he has been practicing. So And and Josh Harris has entered the transfer portal as well. Yes. So I assume he's not going to be playing for NC State. Uh, like no. one, yeah, once a player enters the portal, yes. pretty much they're – they can, uh, as as I noted earlier today, Mac Brown said that you know there's going to be three or four guys that have entered the transfer portal for them that they expect to play in their bowl game. So uh, Dave Jordan was asked about this very same thing last week, and a lot of people were like, "Why are they asking him about this? This is ridiculous." Right. It's because the NCAA rule does say that a team, a player that is in the transfer portal, can play for your team in the bowl game. Dave Doran shut that down and said. Nobody that's in the transfer portal for us is going to be playing in a bowl game for us. That's that's an opportunity that the players that are on this team have earned. Right. They're right. not going to be playing uh, in, in the in the bowl game for us if they've entered the transfer portal and have said they're going to be leaving the program. Right. So that definitively was that question as it relates to uh, to Josh. So, um, but, you know, and, and I, you know, 
opportunity didn't present itself, but I, I was going to mention to uh, Shy when we had him on the first segment that it feels like NC State, again, is a team that hasn't had a, a large number of guys enter the portal relative to the overall transfer portal market. Um, we've all just always kind of, you know, discuss it as a sign, a healthy sign that, that mm-hmm. NC State has a good culture and that players are wanting to stick around and, and follow through. It, I mean, do you still get that same sense? Uh, it, it, are we, is that a, a still a logical conclusion that uh, fans can can draw from the relatively limited number of players entering the portal? Yeah, and I mean, I don't think it's over either. Um, I think there might be some players that may be waiting until after you know the bowl game or may wait until after spring. Uh, because there's there's currently two transfer portal windows now. They, that's what they've opened it up to. So you have mm. a 45 day window right after the season, you know, or beginning of December uh, that lasts until you know basically midway through January, and then you have another one that's right after spring camp closes uh, that that players can enter the transfer portal. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot more guys probably enter. Uh, after that point, and the sole reason I say that is because after spring camp, after spring camp, you mm-hmm. know, from NC State, and the sole reason for that is they're bringing a lot of guys in, and not all of them have announced. Uh, Dawson Jamarillo or Jamarillo has announced today that he was going to that he was going to come to NC State. Uh, obviously, there's been a couple other guys that have that have said they're going to come to NC State too. Uh, you know, one of the one of the main ones being Terrence Hinton that said this morning he was going to come to NC State. Uh, that's a cornerback that's going to come over. Uh, has to play multiple places in the secondary as well. And uh, then they have another one that just announced over the weekend, uh, you know, a receiver that came for, that's going to be coming from Clemson too, uh, and Dakari Collins, uh, former four star guy. So I think all of these players coming into the mix and, you know, players kind of seeing where they sit on the depth chart by the end of this and thinking they may have an opportunity going into next year and say a, a freshman that comes in and beats them out and they're on, they're higher on the depth chart. Say a, you know, a guy like Takari Collins comes in and, and immediately is, you know, propelled into a, you know, first team reps after spring practice. Uh, mm-hmm. That's going to probably have some guys looking very seriously at the transfer portal. So I do think it's it says a lot about the culture for NC State and and the potential for next year that a lot of players are still wanting to stick around, even though they could have gone to the transfer portal. But I, I definitely don't think this is the end of it for NC State, where you're going to see some guys still want to enter and, and still go to other places too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think we kind of assumed heading into this, uh, well, you know, the season technically hasn't ended, obviously, because the bowl game is yet to be played. But you know, kind of the the start of the off season that we would see more this year than we had in in a you know the year prior. But uh, I I do I do still think it's a as an encouraging sign that you know. Uh, you don't have just guys fleeing left and right or, you know, taking opportunities that may or may not be good fits, but they're just, they seem to be looking for a reset or, or just an opportunity to kind of get out and start over versus, yeah. you know, like it's hard to, you know, begrudge a guy like Josh Harris because D, D linemen, particularly interior D linemen are such a valuable commodity. Like I, I imagine he's going to get, uh, you know, uh, secure the bag, as the young people yeah. say. Uh, well, he's already at Ole Miss now, so he's okay. already he's already committed. To so Ole the ba- Miss. bag yeah. has been secured. So yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So um, you know, I, I do uh, not to get too far down this rabbit hole, but you know, that's that's an area where I think NC State's really going to have to try to shore up is in future season is making sure that linemen, particularly offensive linemen and defensive linemen, um, you know, we hang on to them as best we can because those premier programs, the blue bloods who have the, the NIL money to throw oh, yeah. around, not to mention the name, the brand um, that they're always in need of, of linemen. And, and uh, it makes in, NC state, especially their track record of developing guys means that uh, there's, there's going to be opportunities for guys to seek opportunities elsewhere. And, and it'll be on us to try to, you know, good job of retaining them and keeping them in the fold. Yeah. And one thing I will say too, I mean, it's, it's been brought up, you know, on multiple occasions, whether it's Dave Doran, you know, we heard it from Mac Brown earlier today and, and coaches all across the country saying that, uh, you know, one of the big things for them is the fact that a lot of, a lot of coaches are not, you know, they're not even trying to bypass it anymore. They're not even trying to wait until a player's in the transfer portal to, you know, to have a, uh, somebody reach out to, an aunt or, you know, their mother or, right. you know, have an NIL representative to, to go and tell them, Hey, this is what we can offer you, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, look, it's, it's shady stuff that's, that's going on. And, and some kids, you know, 
whether they believe it or not, are, are saying, all right, well, I know I have an opportunity with this team. I'm going to jump into the transfer portal, and, and that's where I'm going to go, uh, only to find out that, you know, that team has been saying that to three other guys. Right. And, you know, they might end up going after that guy instead. So, I mean, in, in the case of – I'll give you one example. This is not to say that this is necessarily the way that things went down, but, you know, for a guy like Devin Leary who entered the transfer portal yeah. and – all the talk initially was about Notre Dame and, and Notre Dame was going to be the team that was going to go after him, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it sounded like, you know, right afterwards that it was kind of leaning more towards a guy like Hudson Card, uh, who granted has not had nearly as much uh, of a, you know, an impact on the college football game as, as a guy like Devin Leary, but also doesn't have the injury flags. Right. Uh, also doesn't have two, you know, two season ending injuries uh, on his name. So, while they were saying, you know, hey, you're our guy, you're our guy. Well, another guy enters the portal and they they go after him. So that's the that's the game that you're playing right now. And and at the same time, only a third of the players who have entered the transfer portal over the last two years have gone on to to go to a Division One program. So mm. that's I mean that's a, that's the game you're playing with right now. Yeah. Wow. That's some sobering and, statistics. And several of them, several of them have just not gone back to the college game at all. Wow. That's even more sobering. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I feel like that that too is going to be part of what we uh, we uh, I'm not a part of this, but like, but what the college game has to do, coaches, administrators, you know, everyone is educate these guys on. Look, these are the numbers. Like, you know, a third of the guys who uh, enter the portal end up, you know, things working out. The other two thirds, you know, uh, end up either out of the game altogether or in you know a, a lower division. So. Um, just be aware of that and, and all, you know, uh, like most things, you know, you, you learn about it, you, you try to make the best decision with the available information and, and go from there. But uh, it behooves NC State and other places to uh, educate their players on that sort of thing. So, yeah. And as I mentioned, NC State is getting a lot of good players in return, you know, players to replace them as of right now. Jakari Collins, as I mentioned, not to say he's, you know, immediately replacing a guy like Devin Carter, but he does have multiple years of eligibility. He is a former four-star receiver, has really good speed and good size uh, that has worked, uh, you know, as you've seen over the last couple of years. Uh, <laughs> one big thing that, that Robert and I loves to do is to play with big, big wide receivers. Whether they're tight ends or wide receivers, he likes to be able to move them around. Uh, as, as NC State found out yeah. last year, unfortunately. I but have Gadsden PST. <laughs> The PTSD. PTSD. Yeah. God, I have, <laughs> so I have get, also have trouble with the English language. <laughs> but you get a guy that's a six four, six five receiver that that comes into NC State and and has a really good chance to make an impact next year, as well as Dawson Amarillo that that uh, Jim Marilla comes in too. Uh, that you know, looking into to next year, he has a chance to make a big impact with a guy like Chandler Zavala moving moving on, uh, and you know Grant Gibson moving on. There's going to be a lot of shuffling. Uh, in this this offensive line for next year. Uh, and I do think they're going to end up with quite a few more, maybe a defensive lineman that might come into the mix. And then, you know, another cornerback, as of right now that we know, uh, probably comes into to the mix too. So we're not revealing anything for these guys, but uh, they, they've got some, they've got some uh, big names that will probably enter the mix too uh, that they'll have for, you know, the start of spring practice next year, uh, whether it's from the transfer portal or, you know, from from recruiting too because we've seen a couple guys over the past week you know decommit from nc state that they're trying to replace too yeah and i don't know if we covered it last week but uh from a you know you mentioned robert and i uh he's reunited with garrett 2j uh as the offensive line coach who comes over from virginia um you know is that going to have uh i feel like we had a decommit on the offensive line if i'm not mistaken three-star kid uh whose name escapes me um, should we expect guys entering the portal or maybe becoming a, a landing option because of either an I or two J being now on the staff? Yeah. Well, I mean, Dawson, the, the kid that committed from Oregon today uh -huh. directly said, and he spoke to Michael Clark about it was, was planning on that being the announcement for him. He had, he had planned on that, uh, that to be the announcement to the world that he was committing to NC state, but other things happened. Uh, and, and he said that it, you know, speaking to Garrett 2J was a direct result of, of him wanting to come to NC State. He sat down, watched tape of of what he's done with previous offensive linemen, 
And, you know, he had a bond with him previously because he, he recruited him when he was at Virginia mm -hmm. uh, to come to Virginia. And he ultimately went to Oregon, uh, you know, and he said, you know, now on a second look, I want to go play for Garrett 2J. So he has a chance to, you know, to make an impact on him still uh, next year at NC State. And Charlie Simons was the player that you were talking about uh, that did decommit from NC State. And he was somebody that NC State liked, uh, you know, definitely early on. Uh, and, and an offensive tackle that, you know, you just – they don't come by very often. You right. need offensive tackles as much as you can get, especially a guy with that much size. But they feel good about the the remainder of the class that they have still. Uh, and, you know, Garrett 2J has already gone out and, and recruited every single one of those guys to keep them with NC State. So they should still have a four to five player offensive line class coming in next year, whether it's freshmen or whether it's, uh, you know, guys from the transfer portal too. And just real quick before we move on to basketball, from a recruiting standpoint, is 2J uh, a solid recruiter? Is, is he an active recruiter? I mean, he was the recruiting coordinator at UVA, so well, that, that tells you, yeah. I mean, and and we spoke to, and these are these are all VIP stories that I'm promoting here. So, if, if you haven't checked out the VIP from Pack Pride, make sure that you do. Because, Hit him with the sales pitch, Corey. Yeah, because you know Michael Clark speaks to as many people as he can to give yeah. you as much background uh, on these guys, and he spoke to uh, Jackie that works at our. Uh, I'm not going to try to butcher her last name. Uh, but Jackie, that works on our UVA site, uh, and and she she spoke to him last week and and told him that, you know, during the during the previous years, uh, he's been the offensive coordinator for multiple years, whether it was under the current staff or the previous staff, and said that basically they brought him in as kind of the closer. Like his personality is just hmm. that that good, and uh, and you know he really enjoys being obviously he's, as as most people have probably seen, he enjoys being on social media and and reaching out to to people that way. Uh, has no, uh, you know, qualms about you know putting himself out there, uh, and I think that that will will reverberate with uh, with players in the future for NC State and and who they're, whoever they're going after, whether it's in the transfer portal or you know future recruits too. Uh, and it sounds like his his personality just really is is infectious. You know, one of the big names that obviously NC State has been going after and has built a, a close relationship with John Garrison before he uh, moved on and went to you know down to Ole Miss. Uh, was David Sanders Jr., which happens to be the number one overall recruit in the 2025 class. So I'm pretty sure that's going to be the next. After we move on from all of the you right. know, the guys in his current class and guys like that, he might just generally bypass 2024 initially and, and go after David Sanders Jr. because <laughs> that's going to be a guy that you really need uh, from Providence Day, and, and that's, that's a player that they really, really want in that class. And they were – in a very good mix. I mean, he's been wearing, you know, NC State gloves during games, and he's been, you know, on NC State campus three, four, five times uh, for games or camps. So uh, that's going to be who his next, more than likely his next target is going to be after we move on from this cycle. Nice, nice. All right, well, stay tuned. Subscribe to Pack Pride Premium. Get in that VIP access. Hey, it's 50% off right now through the rest of December. Uh, if you go. sign up through the rest of December, so great Christmas gift. Uh, also gets you Paramount Plus for free. Uh, so that gets you, you know, Taco nice. Maverick. If you haven't seen it, if you want to see it for free for an entire year, sign up to Pack Pride. That that comes out December twenty second. It's only on Paramount Plus. And the new Beavis and Butthead. Oh, sure. <laughs> also that. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk more some of that. more of your crowd, right? Yeah. <laughs> Us old uh, Gen Xers over here, reliving our MTV days. Um, mm -hmm. All right, um, let's talk real quick. I uh, did watch Beavis and Butthead to America. Okay. Yeah. All right. But, but I watched a little bit of early on too. That uh, and Ren uh, Stippy. So yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So you, you're you're uh, an elder millennial. Uh, I wasn't allowed to, but I did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I hope your mom doesn't listen to this podcast. Well, actually, I hope she does listen to this podcast. I hope she didn't hear that part. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, let's talk real quick some basketball. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to make light of it. A, a nice, huge uh, win against Vanderbilt. Um, one in which they were trailing. Stage a nice comeback and, yeah. and uh, win that game up in uh, Chicago to what apparently, uh, uh, as uh, it sounded on the radio, there was maybe 12 people in the stands. Um, <laughs> I could hear individual coaches coaching, um, but, you know, it, it, it is the holidays and uh, it was a game that started at uh, 1030 Eastern, uh, 930 Central. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, a, a nice 70, 66 win. Uh, big game for DJ Burns, um, you know. You know, it feels like we are getting performances from uh, some of these key players on the roster. You know, you know, Casey Morsell had, yeah. you know, some some big weeks there. 
uh, and now DJ is starting to fit in. Feels like if we can kind of get everybody, you know, hitting on all cylinders as we start uh, getting into the meat of the ACC play, this team has a chance to really do uh, some damage, but obviously they've got a, a tough slate. You know, I know Louisville's struggling. That'll be their next game uh, coming up this week on Thursday. Um, but it sounds like uh, the meat of the schedule – uh, really hits, you know, hard uh, starting, you know, in after the, the Louisville game. Yeah, I was going to say that was a really critical win from the sense that you <laughs> you really needed that because obviously Louisville coming up is is a winnable game for NC State to get the first ACC win. Uh, but man, I mean, you know, Miles and I talked about it the other night on the post game podcast how difficult this upcoming schedule is for NC State, and yeah, that is a uh, it's a, it's a gauntlet. I mean, you you start off with Duke the next game. Uh, and then you have um, – Well, I think you have Clemson after Louisville. Yeah, Clemson after Louisville, and then Duke, and then you have Virginia Tech, which is also a ranked team that you play on the road. Yeah. You have Miami that you've already lost to. Right. Granted, very close game, very winnable game for NC State. You have them coming into to Raleigh. Uh, and then, you know, Georgia Tech being on the road, always a tough place that, that for NC State to play, even though it's not a, you know, not a great team, but still a tough matchup for them over the years. And then you go to UNC – uh, on January 21st, and then my birthday will be spent watching them play against Notre Dame. <laughs> so uh, January 24th, for those that didn't know, and anybody that wants to you know, wish me happy birthday that day. But yes, uh, that will be, you know, it's it's a it's a really tough slate for NC State coming up. and For and yeah. the next six on the road. Yes, yeah. and a, a critical win for them. And, and again, like... I'm sorry, to, they, for, starting with Clemson, I, I should yes, say. Yes, yes. You know. But to your point, what you were saying about, you know, different guys stepping up, uh, we spoke to DJ Burns afterwards about this game, and he said that, you know, one of the big things for him was the fact that, you know, he realized that he was only being matched up one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, mm. And that's that's in large part due to the fact that, you know, Traquavion Smith, uh, Jarkel Joyner, Casey Morsell, anytime they were getting the ball, they were getting trapped. So once they realized that, they could dish it out to somebody, to another guard that could get it inside to, to DJ Burns, uh, and he could do work inside of there. The big thing for him was the fact that he really, really needed to, uh, you know, step up in this game and be able to play as much as possible. I mean, you know, the first the first half, he you know, because of uh, because of, uh, you know, foul trouble that he got mm -hmm. into, he was only able to play, I think I want to say like eight minutes in that first half. He played 19 in the second half. He played 19 to 20 minutes like his previous high before ACC play started was he was only playing 18 minutes per game mm -hmm. max. Uh, and obviously that came before the Dushan Mahorsic injury too. Uh, but for him to be playing that much, that many minutes and still being able to make as big of an impact as he did down the stretch, that's an extremely positive sign for NC State. And for him to go six of six from the free throw line too. Uh, and with a lot of those four of four down the stretch for NC State, that was, that was massive. Yeah. I mean, as, as skilled as he has been offensively around the basket, it seems like he, you know, he has had his struggles at the free throw line. And a guy like him, you know, is going to get to the line quite a bit. Um, so great to see that he's, you know, adding some additional uh, scoring there at the line and, and converting on some of that. Um, and you're right, like, you know, uh, his ability to uh, not only from a conditioning standpoint play that many minutes in the second half, but to do so without really, you know, getting into uh, severe foul trouble down the line or down the towards the end of that game. You know, I mean, it. Vanderbilt's a team that's had, you know, they're obviously a, a power five school in the SEC. They've got, you know, some size. So they'll be much more in line in terms of, uh, you know, quality opponent than what, you know, what NC State will face as they get into the media, the ACC scheduled them versus, you know, kind of what they had faced previously. Yeah. And I mean, granted, this is a five and six team. It's not, right. it's not a great, you know, high major team, but there is, there is the chance for that to be a Q2 win by the end of this. Uh, you know, being a neutral neutral court game. And then the Furman game earlier in the week, I know a lot of people kind of, you know, overlooked that one. But this is a team that, while it's not high in the net ranking, I think they're only like top 150 in the net ranking. You know, Ken Palm and, and several others have had them high uh, throughout the season just based on the fact that what they can do when they get to, uh, you know, the next, once they get to their conference play, uh, and they will be an NCAA tournament team. So that has a chance to be, you know, an NCAA tournament team that you not only beat, but you beat handily. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a that was a game that they, you know, they routed them in, in, in uh, PNC Arena. So I think that does a lot for the confidence of this team, too, uh, and what they can do moving forward. Uh, and again, they're, they're going to need as much of that as they can, because right now, 10-3 and three going into ACC play, they are 0-2 in the ACC, and they really, right. really need 
uh, some big wins moving forward. Yes, yeah, it's, it's this weird dichotomy where they've had an excellent non-conference schedule, but they're they're sitting at zero and two in the ACC. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, with one with one kind of bad loss being to a Pitt team that also lost to the Vanderbilt team. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. I, and, and I never love it when we come on the uh, the losing end of the uh, you know uh, correlated uh, victories. Cor- correlated losses are are one of those things that you uh, you never like to have to uh, parse out. Um, all right, real quick before we get out of here, uh, women's basketball, um, three wins against, you know, um, you know, I, I'll let you be the judge uh, since I'm not as versed on it, but the quality opponents, USF, Davidson, Clemson. I mean, obviously Clemson being an ACC opponent, uh, they win, you know, by 18. Uh, Davidson really whacks the floor with them. Uh, you know, a, tofer, a tougher or closer win against UCF, eight-point win there. But um, what can you tell us about, that uh, series of wins for the women's team and how it sets it up sets them up for the uh, schedule to come. Yeah, I mean, I think USF is a quality opponent. Uh, USF has made it to the NCAA tournament the last two years, so that's going to be one that I think at the end of the year that's going to help a lot, uh, as does obviously the Iowa win, as does the Georgia win. Right. Not that this team is really going to need too much on the resume, <laughs> yeah. but you get those out-of-conference wins. Uh, Might help be critical. Yeah, exactly. More for seeding, uh, and at the same time, the ACC is is going to be a really, really tough conference again this season. You know, teams like Louisville have kind of fallen off a little bit. Uh, you know, Duke hasn't really shown up as much as people probably expected. But uh, there are still four teams in the ACC right now, including NC State, that are in the top ten uh, overall. So uh, that, that goes to show you just how good this conference is and how good this conference is capable of being. Uh, now, when you look at, at the last couple games, uh, USF was a tough one just because of the fact that you know, they lose Diamond Johnson midway through that game. They're able to recover from it to win that game. And the last two, they played without Diamond Johnson and without Jada Boyd. Uh, and they still are able to come away with wins. Obviously, you know, as you mentioned, Davidson being what it was, you know, they, they just, the offense was just clicking. They were making a lot of good shots. Uh, and then, you know, really their defense has been their strong suit for the last several years. And they were able to do that against Davidson. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Clemson this past uh, Sunday, as we're talking Monday, this will be released on Tuesday. But on Sunday afternoon, uh, that was a really strong win for them. One that, you know, they had to battle back from. You know, Clemson was really strong in the first quarter. NC State held them to single digits in the second quarter. But they still, you know, still a tight game going into late in the second half. And then, again, you know, Alex Sawyer, as he likes to point out, this yes. team holds a lot of te- holds a lot of teams, quality teams, to, uh, you know. Single to- digit. Yeah, it's a yeah. single-digit quarters, and they were able to do it in the, in the second and in the fourth quarter, and that ultimately is what able to, to lead them to pull away 77-59. to 59. We're seeing a lot more from some of the, I don't want to say reserve players, because I think Mimi Collins has a chance to start even when Jada Boyd comes back. She's going to be competing with Jada Boyd for being, you know, a starter role. And then at the same time, you get a player like, uh, you know, like Madison Hayes that's really stepping up. We've obviously seen Sanaya Rivers step up. That's why she's starting right now for NC State. But Madison Hayes is proving why she uh, deserves a spot in this rotation. I think it's going to be – this is – as we've seen over the years, Westmore really likes to narrow down things to, you know, six, seven players. I think it's going to be really tough after what we've seen from Madison Hayes, what we've seen from Sanaya Rivers, and what we've seen from Mimi Collins to not have more of a eight, nine, potentially ten-player rotation even once Shada Boyd – uh, and and Diamond Johnson come back. So I think this only helps, you know, the depth of this team. Mm-hmm. And I think that was a concern going into this year is is how much will a, a player like Diamond Johnson and, and Jada Boyd step up in those starting roles. Now we're seeing other players that, that can push them in that rotation too. And I think that's only going to make them better once they come back. Yeah, you never want to see injuries, but one of the silver linings to injuries is uh, players who wouldn't have otherwise gotten the minutes they're getting do get those quality minutes, and then it just makes you deeper once you get later on into the season, uh, you know, our friend Ernie Miner is one of the great examples of that, uh, yeah. you know, from that great 83 run. So um, at least it could a great example of that as well. That's right. That's right. Uh, do you have any timetable on when we can expect to see Diamond and Jada back in the lineup? Everything that we've heard is that the hope is to have them back shortly after, uh, you know, shortly after the Christmas break, whether that's against Duke or against Syracuse. The hope is to have them back soon. So mm. it shouldn't be out. Neither one of them extremely. Uh, an extremely long time, but the hope is to have them back very soon, uh, you know, throughout ACC play. And I think, again, that's just going to make this team that much deeper. Yeah. 
So yeah, a, a lengthy 11 day break. It looks like 12 day break between that Clemson game that they just uh, had and Duke. So, um, you know, as far as uh, numbers of games missed by by both of those players, this break uh, is going to give them uh, it's going to minimize some of that. So, um, all right. Well, we've had a very full show today. Um, you know, uh, I see Molly back in the audience here. I want to thank her for uh, helping us get uh, Shy Battle on here in the first segment and uh, appreciate him coming by and uh, sharing about the uh, obsession line and, and Battle Island. Uh, I, I wanted to ask him if he designed the logo on his hat, the Battle Island logo. Um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if that was some of his own artwork there. Uh, be sure to check him out and, uh, you know, uh, just stay tuned. Take advantage of the great offers there at Pack Pride uh, so you can stay informed on all the activity that's taking place in the transfer portal and, and all the news that's going on in this very busy time of year. So, um, all right. Well, for that, uh, I'll say thank you again to Shai and for Corey. And this is James saying so long here on the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast. And thank you to you, everyone out there that was uh, watching along and, and listening. Um, Last thing I want to point out here, 919 Wolfpack did ask, this probably won't make the podcast, but he did ask, uh, do we know when Miranda will make his debut? And he pointed out that. the dunk during pregame uh, was impressive and it looked like effortless for him. I don't know exactly when we'll see him, but everything we've heard is that probably the beginning of the year is when they, they plan to – you know, ease him into the system. Uh, I want to let people know on the live podcast before we uh, wrap this up. But yeah, I think I think you'll more than likely see him early on. Uh, the word I got back from uh, from you know initial practices was he looked kind of like a baby giraffe out there trying to fit <laughs> into the system early on. Uh -huh. You know, I think he's going to make a big impact this year, though. Uh, just when when that'll happen, we don't know, but uh, I expect to see him. You know, early on in January, probably make an impact, and then. Potential for uh, Dusha Mahorchic to be back by late January, so you could have two of the you know both of them be able to make an impact by by February. Nice, and I'm going to do my part to splice that in onto the actual podcast. So nine one nine Wolfpack, thank you for asking that question. I'm going to do my part to try to get it into the actual show that that drops. So thank you for asking that. All right, now we can officially say goodbye. Peace, Merry Later, Christmas, guys. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs>